Welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. Thank you so much for being here. If you're new to the channel, I am a board certified internist and rheumatologist based out of Dallas, Texas. And here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it's all connected. If that sounds like something you're interested in, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the bell, and um, like the light, hit the likes. Um, we are here really to provide education. We believe that everyone deserves to participate in their own care. And the first step in doing that is educating yourself about your condition, about your symptoms, about what you can do for yourself. And that's the best way to partner with your rheumatologist. And so in order to kind of propel that mission, if you hit all those buttons and likes and whatnot, that helps get us in front of more eyeballs and just kind of keep it going. All right, so today we're talking about a very specific blood test, but if you have lupus or any other autoimmune condition, it's a blood test that you are probably very familiar with, and that is complements. We're gonna be talking about what they are, what they mean, why we test them, all of it. So stick around. Okay, so let's just start at the basics. What are complements? Complements are simply proteins that are found in our plasma. And by plasma, I mean our blood. And they are a part of our immune system that can become activated when presented with an antibody or an antigen. Now, what are those words? Well, for better or for worse, I think we've all become very familiar with the word antibody, right? It's a part of our immune system that identifies and then can attach to any foreign material that it finds in our body. And that foreign material is the antigen. Antigen is just a fancy word for foreign material. So when the antigen is floating around and the antibody sees it and identifies it, the antibody goes and attaches to it and that forms the immune complex. So getting back to complements, when the complement sees this immune complex, it gets activated. And that activation then alerts the rest of the immune system that, hey, something foreign is here and we need to do something about it. And it sets off this cascade, this complement cascade that then calls out to all the other immune cells to come and like handle this foreign material that's been identified. And it's really an integral part of our immune system. These, this complement cascade, this complement system is what keeps us healthy against infections. Now the reason this comes up with autoimmune conditions is there are a number of autoimmune conditions where we know that we can see an abnormal complement level in our blood. And when I say abnormal, what I really mean is low. And there are a number of conditions where this is the case. Conditions such as vasculitis, which really is kind of an umbrella term that covers a whole slew of other conditions, where basically the unifying factor is that there is inflammation in the blood vessels, hence vasculitis. Other conditions such as antiphospholipid syndrome, Sjogren's syndrome, mixed cryoglobulinemia, hemolytic autoimmune anemia, and glomerulonephritis all have low complement levels. Now, I know I just threw out a whole bunch of like technical medical sounding terms. And quite honestly, unless you are dealing with one of those conditions, you most likely have never heard of half the words I just said. Um, but suffice to say that there are a lot of autoimmune conditions where abnormal complement levels or low complement levels are something that happens and that we look for. The most common condition, however, that we associate with low complements is lupus. Talk about testing for low complement levels. It's really two that we test for, complement three and complement four. Now, as I've kind of alluded to and said, there's a whole complement cascade. And so there are multiple different types of complements, complement one all the way to like complement eight or nine, nine. And so you can test for all of them, but it's not routinely done. The ones that we test for most commonly is C3, complement three, and C4, complement four. So lupus, immunologically speaking, 
Lupus is a condition of immune complex deposition and complement activation. <laughs> I know, I know. I've, I've done a handful of lupus videos and I've talked about what to look for when we make a diagnosis and what kind of symptoms are common. And I've even talked about some specific antibodies like the double strand DNA. But I just know what I just said is a little, <laughs> is a little much because it is very immune speak. But in the world of rheumatology and immunology, the way we think about lupus is it is a condition of immune complex deposition and complement activation. So what does that mean? We'll break it down. So if you remember, I said immune complex is simply that complex of antibody and antigen. Now it's not just a one-to-one. -one. So you have a floating antigen and all these different antibodies come and attach to it. And that whole mess of proteins is what we call the immune complex. And that immune complex will then go and deposit on a certain tissue or organs within the body. And when we're talking about lupus, that can be the skin, it can be the kidneys, it can be the lungs, etc. Now, why in one individual the immune complexes will go and deposit on the skin or on the kidneys and not on the lungs or, or vice versa, we still don't know. There's still a lot we have to learn. But that immune complex will go and deposit on the tissue. And the mere presence of that immune complex then triggers the complement cascade. And all these complements, all these complement proteins come and they do their thing and they go through their cascade. And their cascade then alerts the rest of the immune system to come do, do its thing. As I kind of jokingly say, it's like calling all the boys to the yard. Like this complement cascade calls out neutrophils and natural killer cells and macrophages and B cells and T cells and all of these cells that are part of our immune system. And this complement cascade is basically saying, hey, we have an immune complex here, which means we've got foreign material that needs to be handled. And so all these cells come to handle it. And the way they handle it is by causing a lot of inflammation. And so before you know it, this tissue where the immune complex had settled now is super inflamed. And it's that inflammation that we then see as a symptom or we'll see as like kidney damage or skin inflammation. But behind the scenes, that was all a product of immune complex and complement activation. See? So while all this is going on, this is going on in the tissues. If you think about it, when we do blood work, what are we testing? We're testing various different levels of things in the blood. When the complement cascade gets triggered, all those complements are kind of going to where those immune complexes are and being triggered and they're cascading and they're activating and all these fancy words that I could use but they're out of the blood and they're doing it, there's so much um, siphoning off of this, these complements to the tissues that are in question that the liver cannot keep up as produce more complements. So when we check the blood levels of C3 and C4, they're low because they're all being used up in that inflammatory cascade that's happening. So, in things like lupus, when someone has active disease or active lupus or they're in a flare, the C3 and C4 blood levels will be low. Now this is most specific in lupus patients who have kidney disease. So if someone has kidney disease in lupus, they are more likely than not to have complement levels that drop when they're in the midst of a flare or when they have active disease but it is certainly not 100%. In fact, if you take all lupus patients, not just the kidney disease patients, but all lupus patients, only about 50% of them will have low complements when they're having an active disease or when they're having a flare. But in those patients who have low complements when they have a flare, measuring complement levels can prove to be a useful marker to judge if the lupus is active or quiet. Now, for those of you problem solvers out there, you may be asking, 
Well, if compliments are such a big deal in lupus, uh, why aren't there treatments focused on the compliments? And that's an excellent question and one that a lot of researchers who are a lot smarter than me are working on. So we do have actually a medication that's focused on compliments and like targets the compliment system. In very severe lupus cases, we have used it and it's been effective. It's actually mainly used for a certain type of anemia, but really I just wanted to highlight that yes, there are a lot of different directions that the re lupus researchers are going in, like hunting for different targets and therapies for lupus. And the complement system is one of those targets they're looking at. All right, so I know this video was kind of very heavy on the immunology and the physiology, and you might be asking yourself, like, this is all great, like, I kind of get it, but like, what does all this mumbo jumbo mean for me? And you know, I always like to kind of bring it down and give you some like tangible things that you can take that you can think about and talk about with your own doctor. And so we're gonna talk about, you know, what are some ways that you can take all this information and apply it to you? All right, so one of the questions I want you to ask yourself and your doctor is, what were your compliment levels when you were first diagnosed with lupus? And this is important for a number of reasons. So for the most part, most of us are diagnosed in the midst of a flare. It's when we're having a flare that we have our symptoms that come to the attention of our doctor. And so knowing what your complement levels were in that moment kind of shows us or gives us a clue if you are in that 50% where the complement levels are low or are you in the 50% where the complement levels are normal in the midst of a flare. Now it doesn't tell you everything because we need time. Time is going to help show us what our pattern is, but knowing what they were in the beginning is an important clue. All right, so the second thing is, just like I suggested, what do your compliments do over time? Now, like I said, 50% of patients will have compliments that go up and down when their disease flares and when it's quiet. And only time is going to tell. When your disease became under better control, under whether it was medications or lifestyle or whatever it was, did your compliments normalize? Some patients have low compliments during flares and have low compliments that persist. And there is some controversy with, within rheumatologists uh, or amongst rheumatologists about what that means, what we should do about it. But the fact of the matter remains, there are some people who feel better, every other marker is better, but yet their compliments are still low and time will tell if that's you. If your compliments were normal at diagnosis, it is still worthwhile to follow them and correlate them with how you're feeling. The problem with compliments is this, we don't check them when we're healthy. When you go in for your physical exam every year or every two years, and you're getting your sugar tested and your cholesterol and like the basics, vitamin D, checking compliments is not one of the tests that are done. So the truth is we don't know what our healthy baseline level of compliments are before we get sick. If you look at any lab sheet, any lab result sheet, you have your result and you have what's called a reference range. And that reference range has been determined by a lot of testing and a lot of statistics where they'll say, okay, this is the range that we consider normal in the population. If you look at that reference range with compliments, it's pretty wide because healthy people, I don't know why I do that. I mean, healthy people can have their compliments be through this whole range. So even though when you are first diagnosed with lupus, your compliments might fall in the normal range, it can be difficult to ascertain if that's truly your normal or how that would have compared to you before lupus. Does that make sense? And so following what your compliments do throughout your course with lupus can still be very telling even if your compliments always just stay within what's considered normal. 
Now, I understand that the nuance of compliments and deciding what they mean and what treatments to be used based on compliments and based on your status is most likely the majority of the heavy lifting is going to be done by your rheumatologist. I am certainly not expecting everyone who watches this video to be all of a sudden a complimentologist. There is a lot of experience and nuance that goes into understanding um, what compliments mean. But I am a very big believer and proponent that everyone deserves to participate in their own care and participate in the conversations that are happening about their care. And just having a base understanding of what compliments are, why your doctor is even checking them, and what your levels have done over time can really better position you to have more fruitful and productive conversations with your rheumatologist as you talk about next steps to get you to feeling better. So I hope you found this useful. I know it's a pretty specific topic. Not everyone um, kind of deals with compliment levels or ever has them tested, but for those who do, I know it can be a point of confusion. It can really be a point of empowerment if you understand what they mean. Um, so I hope you found this helpful. If you like this video, please hit subscribe. Make sure you like. I think you're supposed to hit the bell notification so that you know if I ever drop a video. But honestly, I drop a video once a week. It's not like I ever do surprise videos, although you never really know. Um, but hit all those buttons. It really helps us out. And thank you so much for watching. Here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it is all connected. Thanks and have a great day.